Okay, comrades, there's, uh, I don't know why, but there always seems to be a moment before I do a Marxism meeting in which I'm completely thrown. I remember I was doing one on the Catholic Church and child abuse two or three years ago. Um, and various people I met on the way and said, oh, I love coming to your meetings, there's always lots of jokes in them. <laughs> I had to explain that the chance of there being many jokes in that meeting were incredibly slim. Uh, I got a text yesterday which caused similar confusion, terror. Good luck tomorrow. Sounds like there be, this is from a, an old friend of mine, sounds like there might be quite a few there and not all wanting to hear things about Abe. If you've come to hear about anything other than Abe Lincoln, you've come to the wrong meeting, I'm afraid. That's not, that's not what's going to happen. This is not my reply to anybody else's meeting. So there we go. So I want to start by, by looking at Lincoln, because if, if you, I, I want to, in the course of the talk, look at Lincoln and, and the course of the Civil War itself, and, and the impact he had on it, and that the events of the war and, and uh, elements of the struggle from below had on him and how he in the process not only became thoroughgoing in, in seeing out the conclusion of the war but actually his own ideas changed quite considerably during the course of it. And Lincoln is perhaps the most unlikely revolutionary in history. He's described uh, in Battle Cry of Freedom, the book by McPherson, as the reluctant revolutionary. He was, throughout most of his life, cautious, he was awkward, he was a sort of folksy character, sort of down-home boy. He seemed more likely to be some small-town hick politician than President of the United States, let alone, I know we've had some pretty awful Presidents of the United States since, but let alone leader of a profoundly important uh, revolutionary uh, struggle. He was a man who was elected to the leadership of his party, a process which surprised many, for his moderation in his defence of, 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 uh, of the Union. And he ended up confounding those who admired his moder moderation, pursuing his victory with ruthless determination. And in the process, of course, famously issuing the proclamation that free, uh, that abolished slavery in America. He was born in February 1809, famously in a one bedroom Kentucky log cabin. He was mainly self-educated. He had a variety of jobs. The one that was always got quoted was that he'd been a rail splitter. Uh, before, at the age of 33, he decided he, want, he, he, decided he wanted to become a lawyer uh, and became a reasonably successful lawyer. Around the same time, he entered politics and he joined the Whig Party and had four successive terms in the Illinois House of Representatives. In 1854, he joined the newly formed Republican Party. Now, it's hard to imagine today that the party of various Bushes and Ronald Reagan uh, was at that time the, the party identified as the anti-slavery party. It was the party uh, that had within it various elements. All of them agreed that they wanted uh, in some way to either end or restrict slavery. And at the hard end, it had hard abolitionists uh, who had joined it. Lincoln was seen to be in the centre, really, of, 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 of the various groups, but closer to those uh, that were soft, that had a softer position than the abolitionists. Why was this, why, ha, why had the issue of slavery become so important? What was it that uh, had taken place? The, the key to understanding what had happened was that America was effectively divided between the South and the North, both economically and socially. The South economically was based on the exploitation of slaves, slaves who'd been captured from Africa, brought in in the horrendous slave trade. They put the slaves working on plantations, initially producing mainly tobacco and sugar, but increasingly it was cotton, or king cotton as it was known, that became the key to the southern economy. Uh, and slaves were key to the production of cotton, the picking of cotton and so on. The slave holding, holding pl planters probably consisted of no more than 300,000 people, and yet they effectively completely dominated all, the, all life in the South. They were the ruling class of the South that determined, what it, uh, 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 that determined uh, everything both materially and ideologically within, within the South. And for them, slavery was an absolute cornerstone 
which they built up an enormous ideological defence of in addition uh, to, 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 to the, the practical economic needs. In the North, you had a, a very different social system. It was one based on free labour, with wage labourers working for capitalists, merchants and manufacturers. And with, in the North West, you had independent farmers who, uh, who, 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 who did not use slaves to work on their farms and so on. The South, the two are interrelated and interdependent in some ways. The South depended on the North for manufactured goods and the North bought cotton for the South and shared in the profits of the export of cotton uh, to England. But the South had disproportionate influence within uh, American society. It dominated the Senate and the Supreme Courts. Although it was made up of minority, politically it dominated American society. It dominated the Supreme Court, a fact that was not unimportant because there were a lot of challenges and uh, 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 rulings that were being asked for around the question of slavery uh, 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 at the time. These two systems coexisted against, uh, had coexisted for some time, but increasingly the contradictions and conflicts of interest were coming to the fore. The South, an exporter of raw materials to Britain, mainly to Britain, that's cotton, needed and wanted free trade and friendly political relationships with Britain. The North, however, was developing as a major competitor to Britain, a modern capitalist society. It needed tariffs and protectionist measures to strengthen its position against this competitor. So the two were beginning to develop not only different interests at home, but different interests in, 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 the, in the broader world economy. The conflict of the systems emerged then over the whole question of the expansion of the West, the famous go West young man, the Horace Greeley phrase where the West was being opened up, what had been, well it's always described as a wilderness actually, which had been populated by the Native Americans, uh, was now being taken over by whites and uh, expanded and, and grown. And the question was, does the West become a slave holding, uh, does the West become slave holding or is the West a free, uh, free area? Are the new states that are going to seek admission into the United States going to be free, free holding or are they going to be uh, uh, slave states? This was, uh, th 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 this, this was huge, uh, of huge importance because the domination of, it, it would determine whether slavery or free labour dominated American society. And the revolution, resolution of this question would determine the political domination and the economic domination of the country, which way the country would move. It would, uh, it would uh, Marx argued that it, it, Marx, who throughout this whole, he regarded the American Civil War as the second American Revolution, the greatest, one of the greatest events of his life, and he was writing in newspapers commenting regularly on it. He and Ingalls were corresponding about it. They were, Marx even was writing to Lincoln at, at certain points and writing to, uh, uh, write, he wrote after Lincoln's death to the Vice President Johnson and so on and so forth. They watched with great interest this whole question uh, about, uh, 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 about what was happening. And Marx believed that part of the problem for the, for the South was that there was actually there were physical needs for it to expand, that you had problems like soil exhaustion, so that the, the South had to expand its areas of influence, not just economically, but actually practically in terms of uh, how that could, could continue. Uh, over this question, over this collision between the two forces, there would be a run a series of compromises and countermeasures, each one juggling for power, each side juggling for power, but neither prepared at that moment uh, uh, for, for, for a split. Each trying to, if you like, manoeuvre their way through the process to see which could come out on, stop, on top. In, eight, in 1787 to, eight, to 1790, uh, sorry, 1887 eight, eight, to 1890, slavery had been legally excluded from all territories northwest of the Ohio River, so that effectively the expansion would be free. Would be free. However, there became a challenge to that in a number of cases, and so that when Missouri applied for a statehood, there was what was known as the Missouri Compromise, which allowed Missouri in as a slave state, even though that had been excluded. Then you had, in, in reaction to that, the Wilmot Proviso, which made sure that California would actually be a, a, a slave-free state. 
And still these battles went on. You had the, what was known as the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, which now began to argue, and uh, uh, this became a, a popular focus for the Democratic Party in the North, I'll come on to, to that, in, in the North, that it should, the, the decision should be left to popular suffrage in the, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the territories themselves. So that in Kansas, Nebraska, it should be the people who decided whether it was slave states or, or free states, rather than federal government, which made that decision. And this was to light the heart of much that went on. In 1857, you had what was became known as the Dred Scott uh, case. Dred Scott had been, was a man in his 60s who had been a slave all his life, but the people, uh, the slave owners, he was actually owned by a teacher and his wife who owned him, had left a slave state to move to a free territory and later to a free state. He argued, he went to court saying, that once he was living in a free area, he surely had to be a free man uh, and his wife a free woman. And the case went to court, uh, and the court actually found that any American citizen has the right to take with him any property recognised by the Constitution. In other words, that your slave was your property, it didn't matter if you moved from one place to the other, you still had the right uh, to, to, to keep your slave. On top of that, there was the Fugitive Slave Act, so that if slaves escaped from the slave territories into the free areas, uh, they, they would legally be returned to, uh, to, to the slaveholders. Uh, and so the, you could see that the South was fighting every inch of the way to win the battle over the expansion of the West, and not just to maintain slavery, but to extend it. The split between these two systems was reflected in the political parties. The Republicans, as I said, who emerged out of the Whigs, were essentially the party of the North of the wage labour system and included the abolitionists. The Democrats split uh, into a Southern party of slavery and a Northern party which, uh, which although against secession, was in favour of compromise with the South and strongly anti-abolitionist. So they would support the measures that, are, that they didn't want the slavery introduced into the North, but they would support the measures that defended slavery uh, in the South. At the radical end of the Republican Party stood one of the two elements of revolution from below, which was so important in the process, the abolitionists. Um, most of the abolitionists, uh, white abolitionists, had religious roots. They were they had Methodist, Baptist, some had split from the various wings of Presbyterianism and so on. They emerged on the political scene in the 1840s and 1850s. They carried what they considered to be the hugely moral arguments against slavery. The, I mean, you know, today, Uncle Tom is a term of abuse, but the book Uncle Tom's Cabin at the time by Harriet Beecher Stowe had a profound, was a massive seller and had a profound impact on people's thinking about whether slavery was, was acceptable or not. And it really did inspire many people to move uh, into the abolitionist movement. Uh, the movement took on a number of forms. It cons consistently legally challenged the fugitive slave law uh, in all ways that it could, but it was also very involved in direct action. And in this, they linked up with both northern blacks and, uh, uh, and, and southern runaway blacks. In, in trying to carry the struggle forward. So that Boston represented the centre of this activity uh, and the people involved in it were extremely militant and extremely courageous. It's that, you know, they sort of, they weren't, they weren't Wilberforce, they, these were people actually putting their own lives on the line trying to see that, that, that the s s slavery would be ended. And you had one famous uh, abolitionist, Wendell Phillips, said of, the, of, the, uh, of the, um, the, the law's returning slaves, he said, we must trample this law under our feet. Uh, they illegally hid fugitives, they helped slaves escape, they physically attacked planters' agents who were sent out to try and capture slaves. Uh, they stormed courtrooms to, to release uh, slaves. In Christiana, Pennsylvania, two dozen armed black, uh, two dozen armed black uh, uh, fighters defended a fugitive and fought off plantation forces, killing the planter and badly wounding his son. In Syracuse, in upstate New York, uh, a group of abolitionists and, and northern blacks broke into a jail and released a fugitive slave and whisked him off to Canada. John Brown, 
who was perhaps the, <laughs> he was the hard, hard line of the abolitionist movement. His, his, his attitude was an eye for an eye, uh, and there had been attacks on abolitionists by what were known as scalawags. They were sort of forerunners of the Klan in many ways, uh, who said they were going to Mormonize the abolitionists. Uh, the Mormons had been the subject of huge persecution and physical assault. Uh, Brown decided that uh, he would take revenge for that. He abducted five southern whites and split their skulls with a broadsword. So he wasn't exactly moderate in his, uh, <laughs> in his belief of how this should be fought. In 1859, he attempted to spark a slave uprising and attack the Virginia Federal Militia HQ at Harpers Ferry. They were defeated and Brown was hanged and the South rejoiced. But many in the North looked to Brown as a hero. They, they weren't too worried about broadswords. They were much more worried about slavery. They looked to Brown as a hero, and hence the song that I presume everybody knows, which I'm certainly not going to sing for you at the moment. Um, the, the, ab the abolitionists would represent the consistent revolutionary forces throughout the war. They were the ones that consistently, the abolitionists in the army, the abolitionists uh, in, in government, uh, the abolitionists on the ground, were consistently fighting to push the war in the direction of, of, of being a war that freed slaves. Lincoln had always been against slavery. He lived in a free state most of his life. In small, he, one small period uh, in which he lived in a slave state, he, 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 he always hated it. But nevertheless, he, uh, he was never part of the abolitionist movement. And indeed, his views on racial segregation and stuff at that point were quite uh, you know, were quite repugnant. He said, I, as much as any other man, am in favour of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Uh, and he went on to support a plan that if slaves were freed, they'd be transported to, to Liberia uh, rather than left in America as a solution to the problem of lots of free black people uh, being there. Um, he made his, that, his position clear when he was elected uh, to president in his first inaugural speech, he'd said, um, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. This is the newly elected president who's going to go on to uh, uh, give the proclamation uh, uh, abolishing slavery, making it clear that he has no interest in interfering with slavery where it currently exists. And I don't think he's lying at that point. That's actually uh, uh, exactly what he, he believed. His, he was absolutely determined to prevent the spread, spread of slavery and absolutely determined to preserve the Union. But he felt his initial approach, and what that inauguration speech tells you, is that he felt he could do this by keeping the border states on, on, on board. He believed the border states, which was, he was trying to ensure that the border states stayed with the Union, even though they were slave-owning states. So in all, some of them were slave-owning states. So in order to placate them, to keep them on board, he would not challenge slavery where it existed. He felt this was the right strategy to, uh, to carry forward and to avoid, uh, and as far as possible, uh, a war. And it's, it's really interesting that Frederick, Frederick Douglass, who, was, um, uh, who, was, um, who had been a black slave and be, had become a very, very prominent voice in the abolitionist movement, the, what, the most prominent black voice in the abolitionist movement, and who later became a real admirer of Lincoln. He describes a, a conversation with Lincoln, uh, which I'll maybe come on to later, around um, the, the role of black troops and so on. But at this point, he says of the Republican Party and Lincoln, they are opposed to the political power of slavery rather than to slavery itself. It would, they would arrest the spread of the slave system and defeat all plans for giving it permanence. This is very desirable, but it leaves the great work of abolishing slavery still to be accomplished. The triumph of the Republican Party will only open the way for this great work. In other words, you're just beginning the job, we're going to have to complete it. The Republican Party are not going to do it. Uh, Lincoln had sprung to national attention, he'd become president, he'd sprung to national attention in, eight, in, uh, in 1858 because of a series of debates with the Northern Democrat Stephen Douglas, who very much was a defender of the rights of, 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 of the South and the rights of slave states and so on. The Republicans chose Lincoln uh, ahead of 
are, are various much better known and in some cases much more radical rivals. He, um, he, he was elected almost precisely because he sort of slotted into the middle of the party between those who were most likely to make concessions to the South uh, 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 and those who wanted to pursue an abolitionist uh, agenda. And I mean, his, his election was greeted with absolute scorn. I mean, he beat uh, these people like Chase and Seward, who were nationally known figures, great orators, etc., uh, etc., et highly educated and sophisticated men. And here was this sort of bumbling log cabin guy who liked to spin yarns and tell Aesop fables to solve problems and so on. And uh, the, the New York Herald wrote, the conduct of the Republican Party in this nomination is a remarkable indication of small intellect growing smaller. <laughs> they pass over statesmen and able men and they take up a fourth-rate lecturer who cannot speak good grammar, sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but on his election, the, 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 what Lincoln does almost immediately is pack his cabinet with the people he's defeated. People who actually hold him in a great deal of contempt at the beginning of the process, although by the end of it, all of them admit that he was the greater man than, than they were, that he, he faced the challenge in ways they couldn't. But he made Seward the um, uh, made him the head of the State Department. He made Chase, who was Seward was Seward was a sort of, of how can you put it? He was a radical, at least in rhetoric, although whenever put to the test, rather less so. Marx was particularly contemptible of Seward at various points in time. Um, Chase, who had been a lifelong abolitionist, became uh, Secretary to the Treasury. And uh, Judge Edward Bates, who was a moderate, became the Attorney General. So he filled the cabinet with people who had very different views of uh, what, 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 was to, what was to take place. And his aim, as he entered the presidency, was to try and avoid war. But, uh, but the reality is that uh, the South saw his election as a victory for Northern dominance and a block on their need to expand. And before Lincoln had even been inaugurated, South Carolina had seceded, uh, had, had seceded from the Union. Um, within a month, Missouri, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas had also all split. And the Confederacy, in other words, the rebel government of the South was now formed with Jefferson Davis elected as its president. In April, the first act of military rebellion occurred in Charleston at Fort Sumter, where, uh, the, where the rebels took the fort from, 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 the, from, the north, from the north. Lincoln's strategy at this point remained very much to keep the border states on board and to fight, therefore, a limited war. Or to, 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 uh, I mean, I think his view was that the South could be if you're almost blockaded into defeat, would withdraw. You keep the, as long as you keep the border states on board, you're safe. And that therefore, uh, you do nothing to challenge the right to own slaves or, or threaten southern property rights. You try and bring this to a pretty quick conclusion. Um, the problem was that this was not a strategy that could possibly succeed. Uh, and Lincoln did want to win. Of that, there was no question. But he, his appointments of his officers almost reflected uh, that strategy. He appointed a, a, a series of officers who actually, some of them were Democrats and so on, including the man at the head of the army, a man called uh, McClellan, who was a Democrat and a, a really nasty character. He, he, he said, he wrote after being appointed to lead the army, help me to dodge the nigger. We want nothing to do with him. I am fighting to preserve the integrity of the Union. To gain that end, we cannot afford to mix up the Negro question. Um, Marx, who oh, absolutely abhorred him, which that shouldn't uh, uh, surprise any of us, said of him, uh, ne his, next to a great defeat, McClellan dreaded nothing as much as a great victory. And that was, <laughs> and, and that was the truth. He wanted a limited war of siege to force the South back on, on, on the old terms, so we'd all go back to where we were when we started. This combined actually with incompetence and cowardice. I mean, 
he, he would constantly say that there were far more uh, southern rebels there than there were, that he didn't have enough forces, that he needed reinforcements. It was a combination of political lack of will and, and, and a genuine incompetence and cowardice that meant that he was conducting an absolutely disastrous war. And as a result, the North, uh, with 3.5 times more men of military age and vastly superior backup, better arms, etc., suffered a series uh, of setbacks. Um, at, at Bull Run, they were defeated and the Union Army were routed. Literally, they ran away. A uh, similar event took place at Ball's Bluff. The South, in contrast to the North, had vastly superior generals. I mean, funnily enough, ideologically, Robert E. Lee, who was in still something of a hero in those confederacy things today. But Robert E. Lee, ironically, thought, thought, thought slavery a moral and political evil uh, and was against secession, but felt it was his duty as a southern gentleman to defend the South. And clearly, he, he regarded rather more his duty as a southern gentleman than anything McClellan regarded for the North, because he fought very well, and, and along with Stonewall Jackson, who was his most, who had won the Battle of Bull Run. Things were so bleak at this stage, actually Marx and Engels are arguing between themselves and Engels is saying, I think we've lost, I think the South are going to win. And Marx is arguing, no, the North will win, but it will have to, it will have to come to terms with the question of the abolition of, of, of slavery. And Lincoln himself is clearly seeing the events and seeing that this is a war going wrong. And he, he says, at one point he says, look, if, I, if winning this war I free no slaves, then I'll free no slaves. If to win this war I have to free some slaves, I'll free some slaves. And if to win this war I have to free all slaves, I'll free all slaves. And the change that really has happened to him is he's fast coming to the conclusion that he has to free all slaves. And in the process, his ideas about slavery actually are becoming much, much stronger. His second inauguration speech, in contrast to his first, said, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills it, that it continues until all the wealth piled up by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil, shall, uh, sorry, uh, all the wealth piled up by the bondsmen, 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid for by another drawn with the sword. Then so be it said, the judgment of the Lord are, are true and righteous. In other words, these people deserve what they're going to get, and I'm going to make sure that they, get, that, 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 that they get it. And it's this that then leads him in January 1863 to understand this man who starts from this moderate position. Actually now, some of the radicals are saying to him, slow down a bit, we can't get this through. If you look at the film, you see quite radical people say, we'll never get this through. And he's absolutely determined. He knows that to win the war, it has to be got through and the proclamation is made. McClellan is removed and new generals appear, Grant and Sherman who are, I mean, people hate Grant because he's, some, he's not like the officer class, he's some dodgy geezer who drinks far too much. And they, people write to, to Lincoln saying, Grant drinks too much whiskey, and Lincoln writes back, whatever he's drinking, give it to the rest of my generals. <laughs> <laughs> the emancipation itself completely transforms the course of the war. It, but and most importantly, it has impacts in what can happen in the South. Now the freed slaves, uh, now slaves that escape are free. And now it brings, for the first time officially, black, black soldiers into play in, in the events. Uh, what are the other key element of the revolution from below. The first black regiment is the 54th Massachusetts. Um, black troops provided some of the bravest and most committed. They played key roles in taking Vicksburg, Fort Wagner, Charleston. This, this, despite the attempts of the South, if they caught black soldiers, black soldiers really suffered a terrible fate if they were caught by the South. And they were also treated badly by the North. They weren't paid the same, they couldn't be officers. And you, you find Frederick D uh, Douglass meets, uh, describing his discussion with Lincoln about that. Uh, and he says to Lincoln, and Lincoln says to him, look, at the beginning I do not believe I could have got equal pay. I am now absolutely in favour of it. Any black soldier that's recommended to me for a commission, I will give them a commission. And he then turns to Douglas, he said, you wrote something the other day saying I was a vacillator. 
I'm not a vacillator. I know I can be very frustratingly slow in reaching positions people want me to, but once I reach them, I do not turn back. And that was true of his position. The impact of the black soldiers was also fascinating on, on, on people like Grant and Sherman, who completely begin to change their views about the, the roles of blacks in the army, uh, and so on and so forth. And in the process, this radicalised army now, which is absolutely clearly fighting for abolition, and there's these great, there's the letters of the northern soldiers, many of whom are writing home to their, their families and saying, I didn't really enter this war about slavery, now I think it's the most evil thing on earth. You see this army being transformed just as Lincoln is being transformed on the question, and therefore they now begin to fight a very different battle. Uh, these new generals are committed to total war. In, 63, in 1863, Grant imposes a heavy defeat at Vicksburg. In June and July, heavy defeats for the, further heavy defeats for the South. And in November, Grant and Sherman drive the South out of Tennessee. Between them in the following year, they cross the South in Sherman's favour, saying, we'll, dr we'll drive them from Georgia to the sea. And he laid to waste everything he, he touched as he went through to, to destroy it. The Confederates actually bizarrely responded by trying, first of all, to offer the blacks their freedom, to, to constrict them, and when that clearly isn't going to work, to actually offer them their freedom if they'll fight on that side, which, you know, given that the whole war was about preserving slavery, tells you that they've, uh, that they've, uh, had a ter that they, they've reached a terrible conclusion. But in the process, you find uh, slavery is crushed, and there's this amazing scene. If you go back to the thing I said earlier about Lincoln believing the whites are a superior race, there's this amazing scene in Richmond, Virginia, where he enters Richmond after it's been freed, and large population of large numbers of black people come out and they're singing, they're celebrating, they're calling him Father Abraham, and they want to touch him, etc. And one man kneels down to kiss his hand, and Lincoln says, "Don't kneel to me. That is not right. You must kneel to God only and thank Him for the liberty you will enjoy hereafter." In other words, he no longer thinks that the black man should be kneeling at his feet. Now, I'm not saying that at this point Lincoln becomes profoundly anti-racist, but there is no doubt a profound change in his thinking at that point. The challenge that then faced the victorious North was the challenge of reconstruction. And we will never know what role Lincoln would have played in that, because sadly a plot which involved John Wilkes Booth and others to kill both Link, to kill Lincoln, Vice President Johnson and Seward uh, took place. The guy who was meant to kill Johnson changed his mind and ran away. Seward was actually stabbed in the neck and face repeatedly but survived. And Lincoln, of course, was shot by these were these were all Southern Southern supporters, all shot by was shot by Wilkes Booth in in the theatre, uh, as uh, I'm sure he knows. Um, and so that challenge, a challenge which Johnson failed totally on the question of reconstruction, which is, you know, the process for another meeting, um, was, 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 we, we will never know uh, how Lincoln would have responded to that challenge. But it, writing about Lincoln, Marx recognising the extraordinary nature of what had happened and the unextraordinary nature of the man who led what had happened, wrote the following. This plebeian that worked his way up from stonebreaker to senator without intellectual brilliance, without a particularly outstanding character, without exceptional importance, an average person of goodwill, was placed at the top by the interplay of the forces of universal suffrage, unaware of the great issues at stake. The new world has never achieved a greater triumph than by this demonstration that given its political and social organization, ordinary people of goodwill can accomplish feats which only heroes could accomplish in the old world. In other words, it's not just a victory, it's a, it's a fantastic victory for, for slavery, but it's a fantastic victory in the march of human progress, in the liberation of humanity, in the uh, doing away with the, the, the old ways. And of course, Marx was absolutely right. This was a fantastic victory for abolition. It was a fantastic victory for black resistance. And it was a fantastic victory uh, for human progress. And it was won by black resistance. And it was won by abolitionists. And it was won by human pro progress. And at the head was an ordinary man who, along with the, all of those forces, achieved a most extraordinary feat. <laughs>
Tim Duke. Uh, in the recent film of The Great Gatsby, um, which is a book by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which combined bookmarks for a minuscule price of £1.99, um, there is a, a major film running throughout the film, and this is a legacy, legacy of slavery. One character called Tom Buchanan, who I think is based on a real life character called James uh, Buchanan Joke, who owned lots of uh, tobacco plantations here in, in North Carolina. Um, this is a fabulous wealthy businessman who rails against the advancement of the Negro people in the USA. His money has come from this, the, the ownership of slaves, he worked his, his plantations. Uh, and in the film, um, the Negroes are depicted as little more than servants for the rich white people who occupy um, you know, the, fore the forefront of the narrative. Um, uh, uh, if you want to see how uh, the attitudes of racism in America lasted well into the 20th century, I recommend you go and see this film or read the book. Um, and, and if you don't like human slave trade today, which still does exist, then you should join the SWP and, and help the world and, and help change the world which allows this terrible condition to, to exist. It's quite interesting why Lincoln was able to be radicalised the way he was um, when I mean, Lincoln, as Pat said, was a lawyer, just a characteristic bourgeois profession. But yet in Europe, the bourgeoisie, as Marx pointed out, and everyone's trying to follow in this, had ceased to be revolutionary, or terrified the idea of revolution, and had failed to carry it out in 1848 when it had the chance. So why was Lincoln, who was the same kind of person, uh, so different from them? And I think there's, there's two things. There's one I mentioned, which is the kind of radical, radicalizing force of the kind of black rebellion in the South. There's two other things. Um, one is that, unlike the bourgeoisie in Europe, Lincoln wasn't actually worried about a working class revolt in the North against the capitalist order there. Um, there were certainly strikes, and there was certainly working class movement in North America, but it wasn't actually the permanent revolution scenario that Marx would thought about having in Germany in 48. In fact, a lot of workers were racist, some of them were opposed to the war, uh, on the grounds of it's a rich man's war, you know, and so on. I mean, that, one would argue with that, but some of them not reviewed those hell. So there wasn't the threat of an actual insurgency in the north that might bring down uh, northern capitalism in, in, in the way that that, that, that threat existed in, in, in parts of the old world. The other thing I think is, is that the north, Lincoln actually had a state that he uses a weapon against the south. And again, unlike the bourgeoisie of, of Europe in 1848. And it's quite interesting to think, in a way, the North only came into existence as a state when the South seceded. Mm -hmm. That's the point at which it forms as a state. And then Lincoln is the force of the army, which of course the Black Regiments took to part in as part of the, the state of practice in a way, um, to fight the South. So these, these two conditions enabled him to actually be as radical in a way as the French revolutionaries of, of 1792 and 3 were. Um, because he, had, he was able to move in a way that was no longer possible uh, for the bourgeoisies in, in, in Europe uh, and, 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 and you, you, you had passed over in a sense that I was to the working class at that point. It's a question really, I suppose it, it, it um, <clears throat> moves slightly off the topic, but um, uh, I'm kind of thinking about, you mentioned the Native Americans, I'm kind of thinking that you haven't got only this war going on uh, at this time, but also uh, this war is going on with another general uh, conquest uh, of the West of America. And with the end, within the end of the Civil War, within the next couple of decades, you've had a war of genocide carried out against uh, the Native Americans, uh, led by the same generals who had gone through this process of conversion of, uh, in, in terms of question of racism against, against slaves. And I presume um, the armies that carried out must have then included significant numbers of black soldiers. So I'm wondering how, it's a question really about how that kind of comes about, so you've got a sense of um, grappling with it all, coming to terms of the uh, depression of blacks on the one hand, but in the same process, not, not being able to apply that to the question of the Native uh, Americans. There's a question really about how that played out. So I suppose for me, one of the questions does come up on the role of agency and class within this, because, see, my reading of uh, Lincoln is that um, he adapted to the conditions in order that in order to uh, achieve the victories that he wanted to achieve. But if you look at his attitude towards uh, slavery, and if you look at his attitude towards the black population in general, it does seem to me it was something that could that could move and shift as ever it needed. But also that the the move by the north. 
wasn't really a battle over slavery at all. And part of that, it seems to me, is it, it, well, it was a battle over free labour, certainly. It wasn't a battle over an, an anti-racist struggle, I suppose, if you like. Because if you look at the, the victories over the South, when they went to reconstruct it, actually a lot of the, of the racist ideas, that they continued unabated, it seemed to me. So you weren't allowed to own people, but actually for a whole lot of people, they had no problem with killing them. They had no problem with the lynchings. They had no problem with a, uh, with a, a, a if you like, a rebellion against uh, black people in the South. And, and it doesn't seem to me that it, the, in the North, they, that to a huge extent, they had um, uh, great problems with this, as long as what they had was a state that was looking towards free labour, a country looking towards free labour, uh, as opposed to the use of slavery. And I suppose, for me, it raises a couple of other questions, because in the North, um, it, that, um, it does raise the question of, of, of where they were going, the sort of class collaboration that was, that was taking place. Because as, as one of the previous speakers said, racism in the North was rife still, abs absolutely rife. And so although there was, a, there was a sort of an argument of saying that it's useful to have the slaves on board, it's useful because, if you like, they can be the group that can break the South partly because this can be our, our, our new army within the South. Actually, the ar arguments of, of, of countering racism, that, that, was, that was less important apart from with it, within, uh, within the battles. And so I suppose, for me, part of the question comes up, what was the role of the, of the working class within the North in being able to fight this as, as a class within itself? Whilst there was a bourgeois battle over, uh, and, uh, over the nature of where the country should be going, what did that mean for the working class? Were there independent working class voices within this that could have said, let's go further? Was it just far too complicated for, 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 for people to do that? So it'd be really interesting if you could come back on some of that. Yeah, it's quite inter uh, interesting how, um, how, how, how Lincoln got radicalised and, and, and so forth. But actually, I mean, the, the, one of the things about the war is uh, I, I think the radicalisation did not go far enough. I mean, it, you, you ended up with radical reconstruction in the South, and, uh, but then the, 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 the occupation ended and you know, the Jim Crow laws came in and so forth. I mean, one of, one of the things that always struck me, Sherman um, seems to be quite an interesting character. I don't know too much about him, but as a general, uh, he famously at the end of the 1860s made an anti-war speech, anti-military speech at West Point. Uh, he's famously at war, they say war is glorious, war is not glorious, war is hell and so forth. Um, but in fact, um, uh, you know, the song uh, has him marching through Georgia. He, he hated the song, uh, I think not for his setting reasons, but because it sort of glorified the war and said if he'd known that that song was going to rip, he'd have marched round Georgia. But one, of the, <laughs> but, I mean, one, one of the things he did um, was actually, as he occupied uh, 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 the, the, the southern territories, actually issued a field order, yeah. which was quite um, revolutionary, mm -hmm. which was confiscating the estates and handing it over to the former slaves. Uh, now that, would have completely transformed the South, but that actually got reversed by, by, by political forces um, in, 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 in the North. And I think there's, you know, uh, there are limits to, to, to um, uh, Lincoln's radicalism and, and so forth. It's, I mean, it's, it's frustratingly slow getting to things, but I mean, it, was, it, was, it was too slow. So perhaps I mean, perhaps, perhaps could say a bit more about that, because uh, that's about the extent of my knowledge on it. Yeah, I guess I wanted to respond to that question a couple of speakers ago. Um, Doug mentioned about, you know, what was the nature of the war? What was the nature of what was going on? Was it, sim you know, was it simply just a rich man's war? Was this just about the interests of, uh, of a capitalist class and the question of race and uh, uh, social progress as a sort of subordinate or excuse or, uh, you know, a function of allowing the health? And I think the point is you can't separate mm. the two at all. Um, and I think that one of the things, I mean, I think it was Cromwell who said, uh, you know, when you wanting, I forget exactly how he said it, but he said something about when you start on a revolution, you never know how far you're going to go. And I think certainly if you go back to, say, even the first American Revolution or the French Revolution, when they started out, nobody was planning to cut off the head of the king, nobody was planning to break away from Britain. But through the process, I mean, it was very self-interested. You know, they didn't want to pay taxes to the British or the France, they wanted, you know, the third state wanted, wanted more political say, they didn't want to pay for, for wars and so on and so forth. But the point is, as they engaged in that process, so their ideas began to transform. And I think what 
Pat really brought out very well. You can see that, if you like, concentrated in the figure uh, of Lincoln, who starts off, as he said, really it is a war to protect the Union. That's what it's about, to protect, uh, to protect the Union. But gradually it becomes clear that if the Union is going to survive, then they have to uh, emancipate the slave. Why is that? Because the whole point is, is that, in fact, if you look at America in the first half of the 19th century, yes, it was starting to become a competitor of Britain, but, but it was still very backward. Mm. A very backward state. I mean, you read Topville's uh, descriptions and so forth. It was a very backward state compared to, uh, uh, to Europe. After the Civil War, that's when you have the, you know, the incredible growth of the US economy, where it really becomes, by the end of the 19th century, a major capitalist power uh, 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 rival in Europe. That was only possible on the basis of completely free, uh, uh, f uh, f free labor. And of course, that feeds back, you know, the idea, well, if we need free labor, then actually, you know, maybe there's something wrong, you know, ethically wrong about slavery and so forth, we could actually hold us back and vice versa. It feeds, uh, uh, the, 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 this is like the material interest and the ideology uh, uh, feed, uh, feed one another. And just, and just finally, think about actually what happened after the war, to prove the point about the, how, how those ideas have changed. I mean, we talk about reconstruction. The last speaker sort of touched upon it. But Reconstruction sounds like, oh, they just sort of went and sort of helped rebuild the South and so forth. No, it was, um, it was a severe and brutal military occupation. Th you know, tens of thousands of troops basically putting down the old slave power, mm. keeping them out of power, splitting up the old uh, 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 pl uh, plantations to the extent that you had, I mean, people think, you know, uh, you had the first blacks elected to Congress in whatever, the 70s or the 80s. No, in the 1870s, uh, you had blacks elected to the Senate, to the House of Representatives from the South. Uh, uh, and that was the extent to which the slave power of the South was being broken. It was only because of a dirty uh, political compromise over a disputed election, I think it was in 1880 or something, that actually Reconstruction uh, was ended. And that's where you get the compromise, which is Jim Crow and so on and so forth, and the receding of those gains. But actually, the period of Reconstruction up until about 1880 is actually a very ideological and very relentless uh, uh, attempt to, uh, to break the old, uh, the, the old slave power to break uh, 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 the power of, uh, of racism and to embrace the potential of blacks to represent themselves. Um, my question is, um, it's not really very relevant to the Civil War, but we were talking about the Democrats and the Republicans, and I just wanted to know what happened to make the sea change from basically to swap um, <laughs> political sort of directions in such a way, because now Republicans, we see the South and the Middle, and Democrats, liberals, the edge, and um, well, what well, what happened, and how did they swap? Anyway, there you go. There was lots of contradictory uh, attitudes towards what was going on during the Civil War from the working class in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, I looked into this in a little bit of detail, and um, north of England, especially around Lancashire, you know, phenomenally dependent on cotton. Um, and one of the first things I ever remembered from primary school was. Um, a theatre group coming in and explaining, it was a little history lesson at the time, but it was fascinating. Um, lots of people, lots of working class people in this area, in the north of England, actually supported the Confederacy throughout the war. They were dependent on the cotton for the mills. And to its shame, Liverpool, was where I'm from, was probably one of the biggest supporters of the Confederacy. Um, it relied a lot on shipping. Um, lots of um, blockade running vessels were uh, constructed in Liverpool. Um, and um, I'd be interested, no, it's just on the back of this, it's a, it's a question really, I don't know whether it was mentioned at all during the talk, I missed the first few minutes, and, that, and what sense of any working class solidarity was shown, you know, uh, towards any sort of anti-slavery movement from Europe to the United States or to uh, the North and the South States? Um, because I know at the mills there were debates, you know, throughout the war, the debates on which side they should support, and initially, as I say, a lot of them supported the Confederacy, but as the war progressed, a lot of them mill workers came over to support the Union. Thanks. Mine's just a quick question. I think uh, um, Pat whetted our appetite for this whole, um, um, this whole episode in history. So my, my question, I've, you know, I've seen the film Glorious, and my, my, most of us have in the room, I think it's a fantastic, inspiring film. But as we know with culture, um, you know, so often another way of retelling history. Um, so I'd like to know, sort of, you know, can um, Pat or anyone else here, or recommend any other films or, you know, about this whole period, 
you know, I, I really want to watch, I want to see as much as I can, or any particular books that you've obviously used for for, for this tour, because it's obviously highly, it's something highly contested, I guess, um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiring, so that's it. Yes. That's a great point for me, because the best film of all is a film called Gettysburg. It's two volume, two, two um, parts to it, but it's, it, it, it covers very well the point I wanted to make about how brutal the American Civil War was. There's a million people killed in this war. It's a massive slaughter. It's the first war in which modern technology is developed. The machine gun comes into play, the use of barbed wire, um, and it, it's, it, 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 this, Pat, Pat referred to it, the phrase of total war. When Sherman decided he was going to win, they drove to the sea and they cut a swathe 60 miles where they burned everything. I mean, you know, nothing was left. It was scorched earth policy and it terrified the South. Um, but you get a bit of a sense of that in um, Gone with the Wind, that's right. You get a bit of the, the whiff of the smoke and the fear and the terror that the white population faced, that the southern population faced. So um, it helps you think of the massive economic forces. You know, it's tempting to. You know, if you look at Lincoln, he's a great person in history, but behind Lincoln was a massive economic force. And once that massive economic force won the Civil War, it was then unleashed on the West. Someone was asking about the, the wars of the domination and the, of, of going West. Um, that's, that's where American, American capitalism was unleashed after the American Civil War and could spread and could develop. It went to Mexico, etc., and built the biggest industrial power. But that's really the force. This was um, capitalism developing to its full potential in America. Um, the, the best book, Pat's got a copy of it there. I think that's the one. This is definitely, oh no, that's yeah, a second one. This is the one. Yeah, that is the best one. This is the best book, Battle <laughs> Cry of Freedom. Yeah. It's a fantastic book. It's the best of all. But watch Gettysburg, it's an awesome film. And General Lee and the beards. In, <laughs> you'll never forget the beards. <laughs> Of course, on sale at the meeting and also at bookmarks afterwards. Yes, following on for that in terms of book recommendations, um, Buckingham Theme is the best analysis of the revolution as the completion of the bourgeois revolution. But so much, enormous volume after volume after volume has been written about this entire bookshops are stocked with uh, books on this. But if you really want to know, you've got a lot of time, and you really want to know what happened in the American Civil War, for my person, I've read a lot of these, the best account of exactly what happened is an enormous three-volume work by my uncle Shelby Foote. Shelby Foote is a, a, was a southerner, and when I started reading this, I thought, you know, what's he doing here? What he actually does, he sets out basically a chronicle, and he puts in most of the sources. So he gives great chunks of the letter here and the diary entry here, and he shortcuts you having to find the original. He doesn't comment on them much, he just leaves them there. This person says this, and this person says that. It will take you quite a bit of time to read it. <laughs> but it is well worth it, it's quite an extraordinary thing. It's one of the very few history books. It's not, actually, it's not his story, he's not trying to comment, he's not trying to analyse, but he sets it all out, and it gives you a good basis to then build on that. Okay, right, let me deal with uh, a couple of things first. First of all, somebody asked a question of films, uh, and people have named films and their favourite films. I think the most astonishing thing about Hollywood is up until relatively recently how little it produced on the American Civil War. Almost nothing. Somebody mentioned Gone with the Wind. Look at it again. And look, you've got the black servants terrified of the northerners coming to free them. The black slaves, sorry, terrified of the northerners coming to free them. And there was, I mean, the, the original thing, my, film made about it was by this... One of the earliest films was made by a man called D.W. Griffith, who was an absolute racist swine, whose, whose image of the Civil War was that it, it was blacks sitting plucking banjos while white men died over their fate. I mean, Hollywood, by and large, left the Civil War alone. And even, even now, when it deals with it, it deals with it in very specific ways. And I think, I mean, one of the things that strikes you if you go to the US, if you go to the southern states, it, must be the only place 
You see flags of a side that was defeated, demolished in a civil war, and yet there's still this sort of this remnants of it. And Hollywood ran away from the question, I think, by and large, did not want to, to face up to, to, to what it was until you began to get Glory, which is a fantastic film, Gettysburg, uh, 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 and, and, and now the film on Lincoln. But I don't think Hollywood's a record on, on, on you know, somebody said there's a, a, you could have, fill a bookshop full of the books. You couldn't fill a video library, if such things still exist, uh, full of the films, I have to tell you. Um, on the, uh, and just on beards, you know, the, the great beards of the Civil War, I have to put a plug in for sideburns as well. Because, <laughs> because, because one of the generals on the north side was called Burnside, and he wore all these things, and that's how the, word, the name came, for sideburns. So there you go. Uh, just an interesting piece of useless information. Um, <laughs> Uh, the uh, just on the uh, the question of the question of the Democrats and the Republicans, I, I don't want to go into it in great depth because it's a completely different meeting. I think the, the 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 transformation where the Democrats are really seen as the party, the liberal radical party, comes with Roosevelt and the New Deal. That's the, the crucial moment. But it's important to understand that even after that, the Southern Democrats remain staunch a staunch block of racism. And in the civil rights movement, when you see Kennedy and Johnson facing down southern politicians, by and large, they're facing down the people from their own party. They're facing, facing, facing down southern Democrats. And if you think of the famous uh, Democratic convention where there's all the, the fights outside and the fights in the hall and so on, it's very much about the, the, the role of the southern Democrats. So, the, 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 I mean, the rise of the Republicans in the south seems to be... To be fantastically tied in with religion and so on, but I haven't done a lot of work on it, so, uh, but clearly they are, they are now seen as the party of the South, but for a large part of my life, the Democrats were still the party of the South, and I remember during the Nixon campaign, all the Southern Democrats became what was known as Democrats for Nixon. In other words, they supported the Republican candidate, and I think a, a number of them uh, probably, probably shifted. Um, I think in terms of, uh, I mean, somebody talked about uh, the, the war itself and, and the brutality of it and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just worth, uh, and, and the, the, dynamism, the dynamism of it, I mean, it's just worth saying um, that the lives lost were more than Americans who died in all American wars before or since. I mean, that's, you know, if you add them all together, every war the Americans have fought in, more people died in the Civil War. The dynamism of it, but particularly in Northern society, was the way it responded to, to war needs, produced massive leap forwards in technology and so on, which were to, be, which were to become sort of commonplace in the emergent uh, American ca capitalism. The Union had the best fed and most lavishly supplied army that had ever existed. The, re the weaponry was constantly modernized. You had the first introduction of things that we all take for granted, standardized clothing size, came at the time of the American Civil War. It was also the first time in the North that you had the mass production of footwear. Until then, you know, shoes were made individually and so on. Uh, just everything about that transformed uh, that society and what took place. In the, and the, the sheer horror of the war was, you know, was absolutely uh, unimaginable when you, you, you think about the number of people who died. Lastly, I want to, I want to touch on uh, two things. First of all, the English working class. Uh, there were splits in the English working class. Uh, there were some, particularly in cotton areas, that were initially, although uh, initially pro-South, although that that subsided. But there were very, very big meetings in in, in various cities of working class organisations, working class in support of the North and the the the, 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 de the democratic impulse. Uh, throughout Europe amongst the working class was to was by and large to support the North and it was very much seen as that. I mean, I, I saw an interview with the guy, uh, McPherson, who wrote Battle Cry of Freedom, where he was asked, in Britain, where did people stand? And he said, well, the working class, there was some division, but by and large it supported the North, the sort of the... The, the, the liberal middle classes supported the North. The British upper class and the British <laughs> absolutely wanted the South to win. They wanted the South to win. They, 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 were, they recognised the, the, the Confederacy and so on. Uh, without ever quite saying they wanted the South to win, he said that's in reality what they, what they wanted to see, which tells us exactly where we were. I mean, 
Um, Neil made a very important point. Somebody described the American Civil War as the last great bourgeois revolution. It was, it was the, the bourgeois revolution which didn't fear its own working class, as, as, as Neil said, and therefore was able to, to carry out a, a systematic process. I mean, the working class in the North existed, but it was small uh, and so on. And in terms of having an independent voice to carry, if you like, the process of permanent revolution, that really wasn't part, part of the process that was taking place in that war. And I think it's important to be historical. Obviously, there were people far more radical than, than, than Lincoln, right from the beginning, from the get-go. And obviously, if you look back at Abraham Lincoln's political views and you, you place them uh, before today's society, many of them we would find absolutely astonishingly backward and reactionary. But there was a fantastic transformation in what took place in him in the course of that struggle and in the course of the, of, 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 of the process to change. Now, you know, the, the, the tragedy, the, the radical reconstruction, which I haven't, you know, this is a different meeting, it's a very interesting one, but it was radical. I mean, it was, as somebody described it, it was imposed. It was, you know, uh, it was imposed. It was giving blacks votes. I mean, you know, one minute they're slaves, the next minute they're votes. Uh, they have votes. The next minute they can actually run uh, for, for Congress and so on and so forth. It was about stemming the power of the, of, of the whites. And you get the backlash and development of the KKK and so on, trying to resist that. Uh, and, and, and sadly, ultimately, it failed. And it failed for a number of reasons. And it was discredited. Uh, quite deliberately by the South in the North. It was all portrayed as corruption and so on and so forth. Um, but, but it would be a real mistake to say that, you know, the fantastic victory of the war, of that war, the fantastic achievement of, of, of abolishing slavery, the fantastic attempts at reconstruction, but because they failed somehow, the, pro the process of that, that, that revolution was a failure. That's a bit like, you know, saying the Russian Revolution, because it ended up where it did. Was it really worth what it was worth? That the worth of the American Revolution was absolutely immense in terms of Marx was absolutely right in terms of the, of the progress of humanity. Of course, what emerges is just like what emerges from the English Civil War and the French Revolution is capitalist rule. Of course, that's what emerges, and of course, all the horrors that we now know that to mean. But in its historic period, it's a fantastically progressive. Uh, a step forward, a fantastically important step forward against one of the, 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 the bulwarks of reaction that still existed in the world, the institution of slavery in the biggest, in, in, in the biggest country of the world. And, you know, I think, to, 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 I think Marx quite rightly recognises the, if you like, the ordinary greatness of Lincoln. And it is an ordinary greatness which reflects the greatness of that revolutionary change.